Welcome to the eLaborate Topics Podcast, where we focus on lab-specific strategies for medical laboratory professionals. We're proud to be the healthcare detectives that work behind the scenes to get the results needed to influence medical decisions. Let's grow together and jump right into the lab. Hi, friends. Welcome to this week's Elaborate Topics. We have a serious and kind of a heavy topic, but also very necessary topic. In today's episode, we'll tackle a topic that's often overlooked, but deeply impactful. But before we get into it, I would like to say we have a very special guest, the one and only Mrs. Dana Powell Baker. Dana Baker, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you all doing? We are doing yeah. awesome. You doing yeah, awesome, Lona? Stephanie? Happy to have Dana with us. <laughs> so we, uh, we are excited for this roundtable episode to talk about this topic and, and go deep. But if this is your first time tuning in, as you know, it's a weekly podcast. We're here each and every Tuesday. We have over 165 episodes in our catalog. So make sure you go to Direct Impact Broadcasting or your favorite podcast platform. Share it out. So don't be stingy. Make sure you share it out with your colleagues in the laboratory, outside of the laboratory, and those wanting to be advocates uh, with us in the laboratory. So as we go and talk about this topic, we're talking about grief. And grief is a normal part of life and it's crucial that we approach it in a proactive rather than reactive manner, especially as we think about our colleagues in the workplace. From coping with personal loss to supporting our colleagues enduring their own grief, this episode will explore various aspects of effectively managing and navigating through the often turbulent waters of grief within the medical laboratory profession for us as medical laboratory professionals and really just people in general as we're working and we undergo grief or, or loss. And so our, our very special guest today, Dana, will be with us on this journey to talk more about it. So let me give you a little bit about Dana before we hop right in. Dana Powell Baker is the Manager for Academic Partnerships with the Association of Public Health Laboratories, which is APHL. She's an ASCP Certified Medical Laboratory Scientist. Her areas of expertise include higher education, learning and development, relationship building, laboratory operations, interprofessional education, and healthcare simulation. In addition to her professional responsibilities, she is a champion for STEM. And as you all know, STEM is a great pathway to being a medical laboratory scientist. As well, she's an advocate for diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Furthermore, she serves as an adjunct assistant professor at the University of Kansas Medical Center in the Department of Clinical Laboratory Sciences. Mrs. Baker has been recognized with various awards for her contributions and service to the laboratory profession, most recently being named as a co-recipient of the 2022 ASCP President's Award. Listen, we don't just bring you guests, we bring you guests who are doing it big. So that's big time to get the president's award. She serves in leadership roles across professional organizations, including the American Society for Clinical Pathology, ASCP for short, and the American Society for Clinical Laboratory Sciences, ASCLS for short. She is actively engaged in mentorship of emerging laboratory professionals, and she is just an awesome person. So if you've ever had the opportunity to meet Dana in person, you know exactly what I am talking about. 
So that was a little bit about Dana. You can connect with her. We'll have her information in the show notes. So make sure that you reach out to her. She is definitely somebody you want in your network. So let's get into it. Yes, let's get into it. Hi, Steph, um, Taiwana, that was such a great introduction. Um, Dana, welcome. Thank you. This, this is so happy a, a warm space. <laughs> I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Okay, I know um, t this topic is a really sensitive topic, but it's a topic that we really need to be discussing among us because so many of us, almost all of us have either um, experienced grief or about to if we haven't, whether it's the loss of a loved one, a pet, or just something. And so many times it's hard for us to navigate it, especially in the workplace. So my first question to you is, how can we normalize grief and loss in the workplace? Do you think that's possible? And if so, how do you think we can do that among ourselves? It's gonna be a two part question, but I just want to start out by asking you about normalizing that, that experience because you have just gone through a grief yourself. Right. and. I mean, if I were to be completely honest, I'm still navigating that process. And so, you know, for those who are listening in, who may not be aware, um, you know, essentially this time last year was a very difficult, challenging um, period of my life um, in which my dad became immensely ill and unfortunately ended up succumbing uh, to his medical condition. So he passed away, we're approaching the one year mark. Uh, early October, actually next month will be one year um, Sorry. since my dad has passed away. Thank you. But um, but just in navigating that and um, I think really it was during this time last year where because it wasn't as discussed as because I was trying to navigate being in a new job and a new role, but also trying to be as present as humanly possible for my family and for my dad and you know, what does that look like in the first six months of a new position? And what do those resources look like? How do I bring this up? Is it is it frowned upon if I bring it up that this is what I'm going through? And how will that be received by my employer, by my leadership, by my colleagues? Does it make me appear to be less than or not as effective as, of a performer if I have this very human moment? And I think that's just so weird because as you already brought it up we all experience grief in some form or fashion and so why isn't it a topic that is commonly discussed openly discussed especially in the workplace um, we are working with other people who have either already navigated through some form of grief or currently navigating that process now but we for whatever reason, it hasn't been normalized. It's almost as if it's taboo. And I don't know if it's because one, uh, on one hand, appearances that we don't want to appear that grief is impacting our work. But also, I think for others who may be on the other side of that, being a colleague or um, that person who is in leadership um, and collaborating with someone who's going through that process, how do I bring it up? Do I bring it up? Is it insensitive of me to bring it up? Is that person in the sense of speaking of vulnerability or are they too fragile for me to bring this up? And is it even appropriate at all to discuss this? Am I offending them by raising this concern or just expressing that, hey, I care and demonstrating compassion? And so I think there's a lot of layers and nuances to that, but I can say from my perspective, you know, I really had to navigate through, you know, I'm losing my dad. <laughs> That's huge. My dad has always been a part of my life. He is a huge reason for my professional success and accomplishments. He was, and I love to think still is, one of my biggest cheerleaders um, or one of my biggest fans, I would say. He's always, um, he always had an encouraging word or was always, immensely proud of um, the work or accomplishments I had. And so I'm like, that's very real. And I would be really hurting myself and hurting those around me, really damaging my self-care, if you will, 
by not being open and transparent and like, hey, y'all, this is what I'm going through. Um, you know, I can't necessarily be responsible for how someone receives that, but I am responsible in communicating that. And so I, I took that step out there and being vulnerable and sharing that. But I want to say being vulnerable, being human. Hey, this is what's going on. And in that, not realizing that invited people to be able to respond, whether that was my, uh, my director at the time saying, what do you need? How can we support you? Um, even all the way up to the CEO, I can express a moment where um, it was about a month or so after losing my dad and we had an in-person meeting in, um, in Maryland in which me and the CEO, we were crossing uh, paths and he immediately stopped. And I'll tell you, Scott Becker has a very busy schedule and I will call him out by name, but he is always busy, always on the go, but very engaged with his team and employees. And so as soon as he saw me, he stopped and he looked me right in the eye and said, Dana, how are you doing? And that to me meant so much, probably more than he'll ever know until he hears this, unless he hears this, but just having the CEO of your organization stop what they're doing literally in their tracks and have a sincere encounter of how are you? And um, it, it didn't require more or less to that. You know, that was enough just to be recognized in that, but to also, it didn't make me feel like I was incompetent or unable to uh, do the work that I had been hired to perform. So I know that's a really long answer, but I just feel like, again, it's it's one that just has so many complexities and layers to why it isn't normal. Why is not why is it not normalized in the work environment, especially in, we're in healthcare. So it makes sense. We, we see life, we see death, but we don't talk about loss. We don't talk about bereavement. <laughs> we don't talk about what that process looks like, which is really interesting to me, but we need to do more of that because simply it's the right thing to do. We, we are caring people that are caring for other people. So why are we not being more intentional and in caring for each other, especially in times of difficulty and you know grief? Yes, I love that answer. And it opens up a lot for us to discuss today. And also a lot of my experience, but I won't go into that until later on if we have a chance. But um, I had my mother, my, lost my mother when I just started a new position, almost the same experience. And so with that and the fact that you took that initiative to just look, I'm going through this, I'm going to be vulnerable, I'm going to talk about it. And, and what you experience as a result, what would you say or what would you, what advice would you give to other um, labs even among colleagues, like how could they foster this culture of empathy, um, opportunity to talk, even for someone to talk or other colleagues to listen and encourage and have this conversation without feeling uncomfortable or feeling judged that look, because I have a loss, I have this new job, they may see me as not ready to do the job, to feel judged. How can we remove all of that stigma and be able to have those conversation and empathize with people who are actually um, experiencing this loss. Right. I think it begins with just thinking about the culture. What what kind of workplace culture do we want to have? We, um, especially when you talk about DEI or DEI and sense of belongingness. Part of that belongingness um, aspect is we want people to feel like they can show up as their full authentic selves in the workplace. Um, and a part of that is everything good, bad, in between. And um, not necessarily bad, but the challenges or the barriers they may be experiencing as a part of that. And so it starts with support. Support is a verb, is one of the things that I that I really cherish in that, you know, how are we demonstrating that support? And that could be in the form of thinking about how do we make this a part of our culture where we say, you know, come, come as your full selves, but also creating that brave space, if you will, of being able to have those discussions and conversations. Um, you know, how do we embed it even in the policies that we have, you know, thinking about, you know, hey, these are things that we, 
you know, openly discuss because we want to be able to effectively be of support to you as a professional, as a colleague, as an employee. And so it really takes that work of creating the space, creating that opportunity for that to happen. But also thinking about, you know, just discussions around compassion care or just bereavement. Do we, you don't see this in modules when we talk about wellness and well being, but bereavement is a part of that. So, where are opportunities to include that in the form of education or um, just a part of our on ongoing training? Um, so that way, by introducing the topic in the space, you're saying, oh, we can talk about this or it may actually spark the discussion just by raising the topic in itself where someone may share. Yes, I've been there and this is how I navigated through that process. And then from another stance, you know, you're hearing like, oh, and this is the process for if you are going through bereavement, this is how we had to go about it here. Um, so again, I think it all it comes from different angles, not just from a creating the space for it, but also providing the resources and letting people know, hey, there are resources available. So that requires being proactive as an employer and as a work setting as well. And hopefully with those pieces coming together, you're nurturing an environment to where that becomes just a normal part of the culture. I love that. I love that because so many times, especially as leaders, we don't know exactly how to handle. I know we have a lot of questions, but um, just thinking about just my, I'm so much relating to you. When my mom died, one of our leaders was one that when she went through grief, she wanted um, quiet. She don't want to talk about it. She don't, because everyone handled things differently. And so everyone knew about the journey of my mom and they would ask every day. And when she died, I called my manager and told her. And after going back to work after a week, no one knew because she used her way of dealing with grief. She thought I needed privacy. So by the time people started knowing, they were shocked. One lady, when, I, when she asked me and I told her she passed a week ago, she broke down crying and I was like, why is she crying? Because she followed her journey and I, no one knew that she passed. And then we saw another um, situation because some, there's no policy where the same person decide let's somebody, two people pass from my job and they say, let's sit in a room and process and just talk, just share about our experience. But she decided that although she don't like to talk about it, she decided to create it, create that safe space. So unless we have some policies or so, it's very difficult for people to figure out how do we deal with these? And I know Taiwan is going to ask some questions about instituting things in the workplace to address this. This is such an important topic. And if I can just quickly build on to just what you just said. Um, and I think that's the other aspect of grief. Really, we don't really explore how in the way how we deal with it. It's an expectation of, well, this is how others cope and how they navigate grief and we can't operate from that space. How I may navigate that process may be different from how Taiwan may prefer to navigate it. Um, you know, people, some people are private with their grief and all we can do in that is just honor and respect that space. Whereas others that are more open or I would say just more transparent in what they're going through. Again, how do we honor that space? And one of the questions that could have been posed is, you know, are you comfortable with me sharing this with the team? Um, and so that way you're getting a front, a, a no, I, I'm private, so we're learning, okay, that's that's how you are needing to navigate through this process. Whereas for others, they're like, yes, can you please be the one to tell them? Because I know for me, when my dad passed away, I, I, I didn't have it in me to call and text everyone. I had to designate specific friends to say, can you be that person? And it wasn't to be insensitive or, um, you know, lack of being present and being the person to express that. I'm like, I just, I could not, I wasn't strong enough to do it in that moment. And so thankfully having friends that were able to step in to be that pillar of strength I needed in that moment. Whereas for some, they're like, no, it's my business. I will choose when and if and how I share it. 
I think um, what's really interesting, and I love when you said, um, you mentioned um, a while back that, you know, we're all in healthcare, yet this is such, you know, a novel conversation that we have, and, and why is that? And so um, what you broke kind of brings me into my next line of questions, because there is a little bit of a, a stigma, or there can be misconceptions about grief, and I know especially um, coming off of the heels of 2020 grief, um, obviously, um, you, the first thing you think about is death, but it could, you know, people are fighting battles that we know nothing about. And so um, there are so many life transitions um, going from, you know, death of a pet, you know, your own personal health, um, you know, losing your house or maybe getting divorced. So many things that so many of our our peers, our colleagues, people in our laboratories are going through that you know, they come to work and you know nothing about those things. And um, even thinking back over my own personal experiences, um, I think I kind of, I probably relate more to Lona's uh, leader where I keep things to myself and pretty much don't. Um, I, I, I grieve um, things that are happening in my personal life at work without telling other people. And, and it might be because now that I'm thinking introspectively about it, because of those stigmas, because of the perception that it might affect my productivity or it might impact my focus or impact my ability to perform at work. And I don't want people to um, look at that differently. And I think as women and particularly as um, uh, minority women, you know, we probably have all kinds of scenarios of, you know, what people may, may or may not view us as always going through our heads. And so the, compounding that with grief um, only escalates those thoughts or perceptions. So I'm going to ask you, Dana, um, from your perspective, what are some of the common misconceptions or stigmas that are surrounding grief in the workplace? And you kind of already mentioned how we can overcome some of those. Um, you mentioned, you know, giving space and maybe asking questions, but for those misconceptions that you can think about, how can we, you know, provide feedback or overcome them? Sure. And I think you touched on it as well when it comes to stigmas and stigmas can also be, you know, related to, you know, just culturally how we grieve. Um, the misconceptions or stereotypes related to specific racial or ethnic groups, because I know just speaking from my experience, uh, unfortunately, you have the the stigma out there that, you know, black fathers are not present for their children. And so when initially I mentioned, you know, just navigating the space of I'm, I'm grieving that I'm about to lose my dad. You know, that's like the first stage of, of the grief I went through, I feel. Um, I'm grieving that our family structures or family dynamic is about to change. And then in that transitioning to I've lost my dad. So now I'm grieving that. But for some people, it was hard for them to see beyond the um, the hidden bias, I'll say. Um, and even a, a couple of them expressing, well, were you really close with your dad? Like, I grew up with my dad. My dad grew up and I grew up in the household with both parents present. And that's actually more common than, than people think <laughs> when it comes to some Black families and Black households. But it was an assumption that you know, or surprise of, oh, you know your father, or you know who your father is, um, and that I had an active, engaged father um, in my life. And and so even just dealing with that or coming to terms with that while I'm already navigating a very painful process was, was almost a slap in the face, so to speak. Like, you know, do other cultures, other ethnicities face that line of questioning? or follow up comments when they express, I've lost my dad, you know, just, just made me wonder, you know, is, is that common or is it because for some, because of the bias or the misconception of how um, black fathers are represented in media and so forth. Um, you know, now I'm dealing with that essentially. And so again, how do we overcome that? It's definitely through education. We need to be direct, have these uncom being comfortable with having these uncomfortable conversations, not just as it relates to grief and loss, but also what role does um, 
implicit bias play into it or um, these hidden biases that we have. Uh, because unfortunately, how someone may approach me and how I lost my father may be different than how they may approach another um, demographic of individual. And so, um, you know, it's, it's, I hate to call that out, but it's, it's, it's a reality. It's a lived part of our lived experiences. And um, one I wish that did not exist because I'm already dealing with a very heavy loss as is and then now i'm having to counter the bias that you just brought up and posing those lines of questions and um and just even having to take it a step further that you know my parents have been together for over 40 years you know so again why am i having to <laughs> present all this information or even in the how he passed you know uh was there some a questionable way that he died like no he actually fell into the top three um leading causes of death in the united states so no it wasn't something outside the box but um but again we need to have the conversations we're not having them period and by having these conversations by providing the education and the resources on just that overarching topic of grief and then we could really get down into the layers of that. What does grief look like in this community, in this culture, in this demographic? Um, what are the barriers and challenges? Even the cases as they, you know, we love case studies <laughs> as uh, laboratory professionals. But, you know, by getting into that and educating people through sharing that experience, just like in the experience that I just shared, I hope that educates at least one listener to where when they have someone near or around them that experiences that loss, they'll recognize that bias when it kind of rises up. They go, oh, let me not pose that question because I don't want it to intentionally or unintentionally cause further harm. Yeah, and I think, you know, I think in our society, we're in a great space where there's so much information and education available for us to learn so many more skills that than we had before in terms of trauma-informed care and trauma-informed supervision in DEIA, um, et cetera. Um, but all the more reason for all of us to remember, again, you know, we just be kind to people because you don't know what secret battles that they are fighting. Um, and when you um, don't understand your own implicit biases um, and are not operating from a completely diverse or inclusive space, um, you could be re-traumatizing a person who may be already going through um, grief that you're not aware of. And so, Dana, in the beginning, you mentioned that you're still navigating your process of grief from losing your father. Um, so if other laboratory professionals out there are going through uh, grief from a loss due to death, or like I said before, divorce, it could be anything that, you know, listeners can be right. going through that are heavy transitions in their lives and they're navigating those emotions and feeling while continuing to show up at work, which we all appreciate because we all have a workforce shortage. Um, how have you been able to prioritize your own well-being um, and why do you think self-care during this time in your life is uh, more important than ever? Yeah, and I think it really just started with um, being honest with myself. Um, you know, I think just as women, especially as, you know, wives, mothers, so forth, we we ha we have these invisible capes <laughs> that we um, inadvertently don. And so we're trying to be super in all things. I'm trying to be super at home. I'm trying to be super at work. I'm trying to excel in all the areas of my life. But really acknowledging for myself that, hey, Dana, this is real, you know, this is a very human moment and you have literally just lost your best friend, you know. Um, it's like out of, um, although all three of us, I have two sisters, all three of us were very close to our dad in our own relational way. Um, you know, me and my dad just we had a very special bond and um and so i had to recognize that i had to acknowledge that for me you know and acknowledging you know this is hard and no i can't just push through this just like any other form of loss or grief that i've navigated in my 40 plus years of life you know but um 
being on and being honest with myself, I would encourage people, you know, give yourself grace. Um, no one is perfect and no one should expect you to perfectly navigate grief and no one should expect you to navigate it in the way that they think you should. It's, uh, although a universal experience, as I saw this quoted, I think by Mayo Clinic, um, it's a personal experience. And I knew personally, I need to give myself grace. I need to be honest with my leadership. I need to be honest with my colleagues. Um, I had to uh, carve out time for myself. Um, when I did return to work, acknowledging that maybe full work days are not ideal, maybe full work travel right now is not ideal, and that I'm not just representing myself, but I'm rep representing a program and an organization. I want to make sure I'm putting my best foot forward and, um, and just recognizing that maybe this is not a good time to do that uh, career fair with students. <laughs> you know, although I may want to, but in how I show up in that space, you know, I'm pretty sure they didn't want a crying exhibitor at the moment. <laughs> and um, but even talking about crying, crying is a normal part of grief. That's how the human body releases, you know, that emotion. Um, that's how we release that stress, that tension. Holding that is a um, is really um, not fair to yourself. And so um, giving myself that that okay to, you know, cry. It's okay to release that. Um, it just shows how much that person or that relationship, or as you said, home, how much it meant to you. It was, it was meaningful, that meaningful to you, to where that rises up in you and releases in the form of tears. Release that. Um, grief is a form of self-care. Allowing yourself to grieve is self-care. And, um, you know, and if at any point you get overwhelmed, as I've had moments of where I felt overwhelmed, especially when I had to start getting back out and around large groups or large crowds of people, I had to acknowledge to myself, you know, I'm a little overwhelmed. Let me find a quiet room for a moment. Um, recognizing that you're feeling overstimulated in a setting. Um, take that opportunity to recenter, to pause, um, purposely pausing as much as you need to and just really transitioning back into life and living um, in, in the capacity in which you can withhold. It's again, just remembering it's an individual personal experience and really educating myself on the process. This is really where it all, this topic for me really all stemmed from. Not just, you know, I'm navigating grief, but let me educate myself on this. So as I'm going through the stages of grief, I could even recognize where I am. Like, oh, I'm in denial. You know what? I'm in anger right now. Oh, I'm in this. Um, so being able to recognize that allowed me to really exercise better self-care in managing those moments. Wow. You know, as you were talking, Dana, it just made me think about being able to effectively manage grief in the workplace. And hearing you talk about this topic, I can hear you and Lona talk about your journeys of, you know, you had a parent that was ill and then going through that journey. And I remember you actually sharing this very topic uh, at one of my roundtables last year, and this was in August. So this was, you were in the, you were in the, the, thick of traveling, going back and forth to where your dad lived from your home. And so to be able to even show up at that event uh, and be able to talk to people about this topic. And so, you know, thinking about what you said and then thinking about Lona and she said her journey with her mom and, and her mom being sick over time, it doesn't you know, makes me think, how can we identify and or anticipate specific needs that people may need uh, to, as they are going through loss to be able to proactively uh, 
provide them with some necessary resources because I know that was difficult, not only, you know, seeing your parent go from their healthy, happy selves to not being the person that you know them to be. So not only seeing that, but also now you're traveling more. Now you have additional costs. Now that's a burden. Now, you know, you're still trying to show up for everybody. So how can we anticipate the specific needs outside of uh, the biggest thing is probably communication <laughs> and being able to know how people uh, want to be supported, but, you know, being able to anticipate if they have already told us that they, they don't want to go it alone, they do want to be supported. So how can we, you know, kind of anticipate that to provide them with some resources versus waiting until they throw up the flag and say that they need help. Right, because, you know, everyone's not going to do that. You know, I know his, historically I was that person. I wouldn't let you know if I needed something and what I needed, and I would try to navigate it on my own. But I like the way that, um, I believe it's the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, the way that they described grief leadership where it's really just that practice of acknowledging grief and facilitating a process and how we approach um, loss, grief, pain um, in the work environment or among colleagues and just really thinking about one, how do we bring that that process forward? Um, so let's say, as you mentioned, you know, some will bring that forward in a discussion, whereas others won't. But as a leader, I think it's important to bring that forward even to those colleagues who may not want to want it to be known as far as what they're going through but I think that's important to know you know is this something that you want disclosed yes or no let's start there also how can we support you as you stated you know if they're saying I don't need anything we got this whatever the case may be respecting that but then going into I understand that you may not need support at this time but know that that door is always open so that they don't think that that was just their one window or chance to have that ask. And even offering, you know, and if you prefer to notify me via email, give me methods, you know, maybe email, let me give you my personal cell phone number. So you could text me if you have any concerns or if something should come up. Um, but really just not that, I'm just gonna be courteous and offer, hey, do you need anything? Great, let's move on, let's get back to work but letting them know, reiterating the door is open and these are the ways that you can get in touch with me when you decide or if you decide to let me know. But also, let's already have resources ready. What do those supportive services look like? You know, from a bereavement space or place, this is the policy. This is the leave policy. This is how you go about taking these next steps and requesting leave or time away. Let's say you come back to work and you find, you know what, this is much harder for me to do this return to work as I had anticipated. Okay, this is what this looks like now. You know, you're now um, filing for this type of leave or this type of request. Let them know it's paid or unpaid, just so they're informed. And even everything that you're sharing verbally, you know, provide that written form of that information. I understand all this may not uh, resonate or you will remember all this, from this discussion, but here's all of what I just said in writing, all the appropriate links, who you need to contact, how you need to contact them. And also if you have any questions regarding, you know, how to um, navigate, you know, services for your loved one. Let's say if you run into a wall financially, as um, we know that every family does not have life insurance or uh, a source of funding to handle funeral services or burial services. You know, here are some resources that are available in our community through our organization, whatever the case may be. So just already having that list of resources, again, that you can go over with that individual with verbally, but also back it up in that written or printed form. So when and if they're ready to review that, they already have that really accessible and handy to them. But I think all that ties into the proactiveness. You know, let's already get all these resources together. Let's get together a work group that works on this, you know, that volunteers to help put this together. It doesn't always necessarily have to fall on the leader, but if the leader can help facilitate that, again, creating a space or a culture where we are talking about this, this is an idea. I think it's really important. 
can we put together a small team to work on this? And so that way we have all that up and ready for whenever. So it's not a matter of if, it's more of a matter of when, when someone will need it. Yeah, I think those are some great tools and, and you're right. It is a matter of when and not if. And if we have those those toolkits available, I think that's very helpful because sometimes it's not a journey, you know, when the loss comes or the grief comes. I can remember uh, through the pandemic and, and losing my best friend and that was not expected. And it was one of those things. I felt like she was here today, gone tomorrow at 39 years old. And quite honestly, it was probably one of the toughest losses I've had since the loss of my grandmother. And that was very difficult because it was a person that I've known since I was 19 years old. So, you know, I think having those two kids and resources available for, you know, if maybe the person had been ill, you know, how that, how you're going to respond and manage in a workplace is maybe different than if it was, you know, somebody you didn't, you know, just all of a sudden, it seemed like an, an unexpected. And I think, too, having those uh, resources you mentioned will be helpful because, you know, if we're talking, you know, loss of a, a loved one or, or death or anything like that, it, it sometimes we always just think, you know, parents or grandparents, but the loss of a cousin to somebody could feel the exact same as the loss of a parent or the loss of a friend, because we don't know people's uh, family dynamics. And, and as you mentioned, those policies, you know, sometimes it don't speak to the dynamics of the families that we have today is you get bereavement for, you know, mom, dad, sibling, grandparent, in-law mom dad but you know what if it was your aunt that raised you what if it was your cousin that raised you what you know what i mean it you know sometimes the the policies and the resources that we have don't always match the dynamics of who we are uh today so i think those tools that you mentioned are, are very necessary and helpful and in, in helping us to manage grief in the workplace Absolutely. And I think it just gives a call to action of revisiting those policies too. Are these relevant? Are these best practice if we want to use, you know, the language that we use now um, in our clinical settings? Is it truly representative of what some may refer to as their family? Because what family means to me may mean something completely different to someone else. It may not be blood re relative or a blood relation but you have a, an, a very strong affinity or relationship with this individual. And because they're not what's documented as a parent, a grandparent, what have you, doesn't mean that you're not experiencing that loss any less. Um, it may be even more in those instances, but I'm not allowed to essentially have the leave request or the compassion care leave that our employer provides because they don't necessarily fall within those categories as stated. You know, yeah. maybe it's time to have those discussions and revisit that and what that looks like. Yes. So um, that kind of um, pu push us into that same topic that you're introducing, Dana. Um, it's great to have that sheet of paper and I think for my organization, we use like a sheet of paper when someone may be going through emotional stuff. Oh, these are the people you could call for finance. These are the people you can call for different things. But when it comes to major grief, and even Taiwana mentioned, it could be someone else out of your family. So what are some of the things that you could suggest as a on a organizational level, the changes, because there's a lot that we can do among us within the lab where a supervisor may be flexible or a manager may be flexible. In my case, um, when my mom was sick, I used to do a lot of weekends and just talking to my supervisor. That was just before I took another role. Um, she said, do you want to adjust your um, 
your time, your, your days. So you can travel to New York over the weekend. So you don't have to work weekends anymore. But then what about, that's a compassionate manager, but what about the organization on a whole when it comes to coming up with new policies to address? Is there anything that you could suggest that the organization can do? Because sometimes people, uh, managers are afraid to be too flexible because they themselves can get into trouble. So how would you suggest um, the organization address these? Well, I would hope that, especially in organizations that um, have a culture where they embrace or welcome open feedback or open communication. Um, but even having those conversations with those entities that have a direct role or involvement in that. Um, case in point, human resources, for example. Um, who can we meet with? Who can we connect with in human resources uh, to have those conversations, whether that's the director, vice president, whatever that structure may look like uh, for that organization. Maybe that involves pulling in some of your C-suite individuals. And what we've done in even other situations of really building that case, bringing in um, those best practices, examples of how other organizations have implemented this or made those changes in policy. Um, because sometimes that even helps to have that substantiation or that evidence of you know, I think this is why this would be of great value to our organization as our our colleagues, our employees are our greatest asset in the sense. And so how are we taking care of our greatest asset? And especially if we are an organization that promotes well-being, if we promote inclusion and um, sense of belongingness, so on and so forth, this is an important element of that. And I would like to see this as an opportunity to collaborate with you and really helping to create a, a stronger work environment and hopefully speaking to those things, that those, those key ter terms of recruitment, retention, workforce. Um, this is how this can help. And can we come to the table together to really explore updating these policies and hopefully come away from the table with some form of agreement in place that uh, will lead to that very needed change. And I love um, what you said because, you know, I've, sometimes as laboratory leaders, we do have leeway, um, but we need the organization support to continue to give us that flexibility for our, our employees, right? And if you are perhaps working in the laboratory where um, you don't feel like you have that flexibility or you feel like, you know, hey, I'm, I'm a phlebotomist or I'm a histotech or I'm a um, medical laboratory scientist, and I know some of my teammates are grieving. I know, so, you know, this person, you know, is having problems with their teenager or this person is going through a divorce and this person just lost a loved one and they are struggling. How would you suggest, you know, listeners who are not in a leadership role, perhaps advocate for themselves in the laboratory? Sure. I think, especially if you find it challenging to really speak up for yourself, especially while you're in the thick of it, um, that's where allyship is key. Uh, so who, who can be your ally in this? Who is that close friend, close colleague or peer, or even leader in which you may have a rapport or relationship with where you can express these things and maybe they can help in really articulating that or even helping to brainstorm suggestions or ways that, not just ways of to approach it, but also how or who we need to approach regarding this. Because I know even for myself, especially being a newer employee, I had to go to my then director at the time with a lot of those questions. I didn't know who to take it to or who to ask or this, that, and the other. And, um, or had I been thinking more clearly I probably would have thought of, oh, I know exactly who to go to for that, but I wasn't at the time when it came to that. And so she was able to articulate some of that for me. She went and did the digging and the research and then came back to me and said, okay, Dana, this is how it works. And so that was a tremendous lift for me and support for me because I didn't 
have to be that person in that moment to have to do all that solely for myself. I, I had allyship in other individuals. And um, but even let's say if you don't have an ally, um, just being able to one, I say document everything. I think that's really important. And also, if you have the bandwidth to identify those resources, um, please try to do so and seek out that support, even through maybe your professional organization that may represent you or your profession, because maybe they have tools and resources that could also help you in navigating that process. Yeah, that's that's good, Dana. I was thinking about a lot of the listeners of this show are new managers or they recently transition transition from the bench to a management or leadership role, could be a lead tech role. And so how or what kind of training or resources would you think or do you think we should provide those those new leaders? so that they're able to effectively support and manage their team because this is all about the people part and you know by background we are so technical and thinking technical but as they transition to these leadership roles sometimes even knowing you know what what to do what to say uh, will be important so i'm curious to hear your thoughts on training or uh, resources that we could provide for for these managers or supervisors? Yeah, I think one, it also starts with them becoming familiar with the policies in their work setting and work environment, having those critical meetings with HR, just to have an understanding of, I know we tend to focus on, we need to hire more people or in cases we need to get rid of certain people. Um, so we may be more familiar with those kind of policies, termination or onboarding versus, you know, bereavement and, you know, what is our leave policy for that? What does that look like for our new hire versus someone who has years of experience within our organization? Um, do we have resources to provide them? And if not, okay, this is an opportunity to, to explore how we can build more resources for them. So I think that's one thing, really having that, that touch point with your human resources department or team, just to get a better, um, depth and breadth and understanding of the policies and resources provided by that entity. Outside of that or beyond that, unfortunately, I haven't come across too much training or too many training opportunities and um, what's been described as grief leadership, but I think there's an opportunity to build around that. Um, I know there's a couple of sources, as I mentioned earlier, IHI, um, who offers uh, some content some content around that, but we definitely need more of that. I think we should have more presentations on this topic, um, especially interactive presentations, because I feel like that even provides a space of healing for some who may not have had anyone to have that open dialogue with. And now they're in a room or in a session with other like-minded individuals in a very similar profession that can share, hey, this is my experience and this is how I navigated it. I think it's so meaningful and impactful to create, intentionally create those spaces for that type of dialogue and engagement. Um, but also just opportunities to build modules around this, um, educational trainings through specific leadership conferences, um, as I'm thinking about that, or different leadership um, online learning packages that I've seen as well. Uh, this is another area where we need to grow and evolve when it comes to leaders and how they um, approach bereavement and how this is another type of difficult conversation, right? We always talk about difficult conversations, but we don't think of it in the context of grief, loss, bereavement. How, how do we navigate that, but also be a resource to our employee? Because that's an important aspect of retention too. If we drop the ball on this and we don't handle it right, we might lose some very key people and we don't want that. So again, I think it's an opportunity to build and develop materials um, moving forward. And Dana, as we wrap up our conversation today, because you've given us so much to think about, whether you're a leader or whether you're a person in the laboratory or whether you're just a healthcare professional who decided to uh, tune into the Elaborate Topics podcast today, 
Um, do you have any final words of wisdom that you would like to leave with our lab listeners um, on how they could navigate grief or loss in their lives? And then if someone is listening and says, you know what, Dana is so insightful. She is a wealth of wisdom. I need to connect with her. I need to know who she is. It is on my bucket list to meet future Dr. Baker. <laughs> um, how can our listeners stay connected, connected with you um, and um, engage with you? Yes, so I think just in closing, um, just really thinking about how um, we can all approach bereavement, how we can all approach grief in our work settings with our colleagues. Um, understanding that everyone will have their own barriers and challenges in navigating this, but I really think it's a great opportunity to make a positive impact in supporting the well being of our laboratory workforce. Um, we do need to take those necessary steps towards fostering that more inclusive environment that does include discussions and resources surrounding grief. And for those who are either um, in this uh, bereavement journey or process, such as I still am, uh, just know that you are not alone. Uh, we, we got you, we are here for you, and I would encourage you to be intentional about your own self-care and uh, normalizing what grief looks like for you and giving yourself permission to grieve. That's the best form of self-care that I could really advise. And if you need additional resources or you need that support, please reach out. And even if you can't do that in the setting that you're in, there are other organizations, um, even mental health partners that we can connect with and just really help through that process. You, you shouldn't have to navigate through that process alone. And so uh, with that, of course, if anyone has comments, questions, you can reach out to me. I am across, I feel like, a good number of social media platforms, but I am on LinkedIn. Uh, you can find me there, Dana Powell Baker. You can find me on uh, what is now X, formerly Twitter, uh, at that lab chick. And I'm also on Instagram at hello, I am that lab chick. Mm -hmm. And of course, email, uh, you can reach out to me, dana.baker at APHL. And so uh, definitely open and look forward to hearing from anyone who has added questions, comments, or insights. I think this is a really valuable topic, and I thank you all for creating this brave space for me to really dive into a topic that is really near and dear uh, to not just myself, but my family. So thank you. And we want to thank you, Dana, for coming on our show and sharing such an insightful, powerful, and needed message. Uh, because again, we we will all have these times in our lives and we need to know greater and more fully how to support each other and be there for each other. Um, not because it is the appropriate thing to do, but it's just the right thing to do as humans, um, all existing together and all connecting with each other. Um, so thank you all for listening today. We always appreciate our listeners and hopefully you have gained so much insight on this topic. Um, from Dana and from our conversation. Um, if you like what you heard today, connect with us on our LinkedIn group page. We wanna hear more from you on this topic. We wanna hear how you are supporting each other in your laboratories and in your workspaces um, and other ideas of how we can improve the workplace for others surrounding, this, uh, surrounding the topic of grief. Always connect with us if you would like to hear um, other topics or if you'd like to be a guest on the show. Um, be sure to share this out with your friends and let us know what you think. Comment, comment, comment. Um, all, to all of our listeners, thank you for tuning in today. And until next time, we hope you have a very great day. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Elaborate Topics, where your hosts discussed relevant strategies for laboratory professionals. Please subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform and listen to us on directimpactbroadcasting.com. Stay tuned for another episode with information you can use to excel in your laboratory career.